My guest today is Nir Shaviv. I'm a professor of physics at the Hebrew University here in Jerusalem. Uh, I've been uh, researching both astrophysics and uh, things related to climate. Uh, astrophysics since, uh, uh, I don't know, about uh, 30 years and climate over, say, the past 20 years. Uh, and in particular, I've been interested in understanding uh, the link that uh, the sun and cosmic rays have with the uh, climate. Uh, and other things in astrophysics as well. All right. And as I was just saying before I hit record, uh, that presentation you gave in 2019 at, at Heartland about the cosmic rays, the, the effect on climate, that may be my single favorite presentation I've seen on climate. Did you want to talk about the basics of what uh, you have found out about the effect of cosmic rays on climate? Yeah. Okay. So uh, back in the year, roughly the year 2000, uh, someone asked me, what are the effects of the supernovae on life here on Earth? And uh, what uh, I uh, stumbled on was uh, the idea uh, led by uh, my colleague uh, Henrik Svensberg from uh, Denmark that uh, cosmic rays are affecting uh, the climate. And uh, what I was, uh, what I realized, I mean, I thought maybe like, you know, a nearby supernova would affect the climate. If you have a nearby supernova, accelerating cosmic rays in the vicinity of the solar system, then these cosmic rays would uh, diffuse, uh, reach the solar system and uh, cause this kind of a 10,000 year old, uh, 10,000 year long uh, cosmic ray winter. Uh, but it turns out it's relatively hard to find such events. But uh, the more interesting thing is that long term variations in the cosmic ray flux due to our galactic environment uh, should be affecting the climate if cosmic rays have a lot of effect on the climate. And uh, lo and behold, um, when uh, you check the geological evidence, you realize that, uh, uh, well, first of all, you can reconstruct the cosmic ray flux on a billion year time scale using uh, meteorites. And when you do that, you see the passages through the galactic spiral arms on one hand. And then you can compare to climate. Uh, a variation that uh, we have had here on Earth by, say, looking at uh, sedimentation record or over the past half billion years by looking at uh, a geochemical uh, isotopic records. Um, and when you do that, you see that um, every time the cosmic wave flux has been uh, high because there are passages of the galactic spiral arms, uh, we have had this uh, IJ, Ice Age uh, epoch or Ice House or whatever it's called uh, here on Earth. So we've had seven such events over the past billion years. Um, and ever since uh, I studied uh, the link that uh, cosmic rays have on uh, climate on different time scales, uh, slowly working my way onto uh, shorter and shorter time scales, and I realized that everywhere, every time scale where there are sufficiently large variations in the cosmic ray flux, you find that there are uh, corresponding variations in, in the climate here on Earth. Um, and in particular, on short time scales, because the solar activity uh, modulates the flux of cosmic rays reaching the Earth, uh, it turns out that um, it is the, the link, the cosmic rays are the link linking between changes in solar activity on one hand and climate variations uh, here on Earth. And uh, you can actually quantify the size of the effect by looking for example, at um, probably the best way is to look at the oceans over the 11 year solar cycle. You can see the amount of heat going into and out of the oceans. Um, you can see that this amount of heat is, is huge um, and uh, it cannot be explained by changes in the radiance. It means that there's an amplification mechanism. And uh, today we know exactly what this mechanism is because uh, we can go to the lab, we can find the micro uh, processes, the microphysical process processes responsible uh, for this. So today, like 20 years later, um, we have basically the full picture. Uh, we see empirical evidence on long time scales. We uh, know what the a, a micro, like the microphysical mechanisms are. We can go to the, we can calculate them ab initio on a computer. We can go to the lab and uh, measure them uh, in the lab. And um, so basically, I mean, it's, um, a, it's a done deal. Like we can, we see it operating on different time scales and we understand what's going on. And uh, uh, I mean, I would bet my house that the sun has a large effect on climate. And um, 
and uh, it's being ignored by the climate community. Okay. Can you talk about uh, how we know what cosmic rays have been doing on different time scales? Because I think you said at one point that on a billion years time scale, yeah. you need to use meteorites that have iron in them because they last long enough. But can you step through that a little bit about long time scales and versus right up to now, how you can tell what's happening? Yeah. So a, a cosmic rays, uh, I mean, you can measure them directly now with a uh, um, either, uh, I mean, we can measure the flux uh, coming in now and the direct measurements say uh, uh, since the 1930s, maybe. Um, and the, uh, so if you want to go on uh, to, to see the, or reconstruct the cosmic ray flux variations on longer time scales, then you need to uh, look at some uh, proxies. And basically, what is often done is uh, we look for, I mean, the cosmic rays are high energy particles coming at high energy. So when they collide with uh, something else in the atmosphere, they usually, or they can break it down into smaller isotopes or lighter isotopes. And uh, we can then measure if, if these isotopes are, uh, for example, radioactive or they are noble gases or whatever, we can measure them and then reconstruct what the cosmic ray flux is. So, for example, uh, you probably all, I mean, you know about carbon 14. Uh, you know that you know, it's used to uh, date, uh, I don't know, archaeological finds or, or whatever. And uh, carbon-14 is such an example. It's an isotope which is formed in the top of the atmosphere by cosmic rays uh, heating oxygen and nitrogen uh, uh, atoms in the atmosphere and then breaking those uh, atoms, the nuclei, into a, a lighter isotope, in this case, carbon-14, which is because it's radioactive, all the carbon-14 that you see is basically formed in this way. So by, for example, uh, measuring the amount of carbon-14 you have in tree rings, then, I mean, you know, you can count, if you know how to count, you can count the, the rings, and then you know that, you know, this particular ring was, uh, I don't know what, uh, was when the, the tree lived, say, 350 years ago. And then you can measure the amounts of carbon-14 or the ratio between carbon-14 and carbon-12 and 13 that uh, you have in the tree ring. And from that, you can deduce what was the amount of carbon-14 in the atmosphere at the time, and therefore what was the uh, flux of cosmic rays producing the, um, the uh, carbon-14. So on timescales of, say, millennia, you can use the uh, carbon-14. On time scales of the of a few million years, you can use uh, beryllium ten, which is for which has a half life not of a few thousand years like carbon fourteen, but of a million years. Um, so you can, for example, um, look at uh, ice cores and measure the amount of beryllium ten, or you can take cores from the from the from from uh, the surface of the ocean. Uh, but ice cores, uh, you have uh, going back only 800,000 years. If you want to go further back in time, you need other uh, other records. Now, uh, one of the thing, one of the things that you can look at is uh, meteorites. Uh, meteorites um, before the um, end of the um, b before they become meteorites, you know, you know, asteroids or whatever roaming the solar system. They are exposed to cosmic rays. So what can happen is that uh, there could be some collision event, and you have a new um, a, a asteroid with new surfaces which are exposed to cosmic rays, and you start accumulating the spallation products. Some of them are radioactive, like the beryllium ten, and some are uh, stable, like um, like uh, the noble gases which you didn't have uh, formed to begin with. Um, and then after, you know, 100 million years, this uh, meteorite can uh, burn in, uh, oh, so this asteroid can burn in the Earth's uh, atmosphere. It becomes um, a meteor, and if it reaches the ground, it's a meteorite. And then you can measure the ratio between uh, these isotopes, the radioactive and the accumulating isotope, the stable accumulating isotope. And from that, you can uh, deduce uh, what is the, okay, so what people used to say is like, let's assume the age of cosmic ray is the age of a, a, sorry, the cosmic ray flux is constant. And from the amount of a product, we can calculate uh, what is the age of the, um, of the meteorite. Uh, but what I said is, no, if you have many meteorites, you can play the opposite game. You can say that statistically they break apart at a constant uh, rate and therefore uh, you can use that to deduce what was the cosmic ray flux producing this uh, these products. Um, so if you if you have many meteorites, you can reconstruct the cosmic ray flux. 
Now, the uh, common meteorites or the chondrites, they're the stony meteorites, uh, they live a short life of a few tens of millions of years until they crumble in the, but, you know, hitting other things or, or whatever. Uh, so if you want to measure and reconstruct the cosmic wave flux on a time scale of a, a billion years, you need something that uh, lives that long. And, and for that, you need the uh, iron meteorites. Okay. Uh, how about uh, just over recent decades or recent meaning since the 1930s, can you see a pretty good correlation between your cosmic ray data and the temperature data, observed temperature data? So, um, I mean, there are a, if, if you want to correlate or understand, you know, say 20th century, I mean, this is probably what you're alluding to. If you want to understand the 20th century temperature variations a, as a, as the response to you know different drivers, uh, whether it is a, a anthropogenic a greenhouse gases, which have some effect on the energy budget, um, or solar variability or whatnot, uh, you cannot just simply correlate and say the temperature is some uh, constant times the uh, anthropogenic driver plus another constant times the uh, a solo driving, that's another constant times, uh, I don't know what, uh, volcanoes or, with, uh, or other things that uh, you have. And the reason is that the climate system is, uh, you know, doesn't have a simple uh, response. It has, it has um, a, heat a large heat capacity. The oceans absorb heat and it takes them time to, to absorb the heat and takes them time to, uh, to re-emit the, the heat afterwards. So... Uh, if you really want to understand the 20th century, um, you cannot just simply do a simple uh, correlation. Um, you have to um, take into account these uh, processes. Um, and when you do that, you find that um, you explain between a half and say two thirds of the warmings over the 20th century um, is explained by uh, the variations in solar activity. Um, and in particular, I mean, through a, a cosmic wave flux variations. Um, but a, and, and, and in particular, you explain things like why uh, there was warming until the 40s, and then there was a decrease in temperature until uh, the 1970s. And in the 70s, people talked about the fact that we might be entering a new ice age. Um, there's a famous uh, letter that uh, scientists wrote, uh, President Nixon, uh, Saying that uh, we should uh, um, we should uh, prepare for the coming of a new uh, ice age, and uh, in order to to frighten Nixon, uh, they also wrote, and you should be aware that the Soviets are better prepared for this. <laughs> um, it's uh, but you know this is this this was the um, you know what people thought in the seventies. So these kind of variations um, uh, are explained by solar variability. Um, it is uh, true that solar activity has decreased since the 1990s until today. Um, and then the temperature still continued to rise, I mean, very, relatively very modestly over the past 30 years, less, certainly less than what the climate models have been predicting. But uh, people have been saying, ah, if the, the temperature has risen since the 90s, uh, from the 90s until today, but uh, solar activity has decreased, and therefore it means that uh, the sun cannot have any effect whatsoever. So, I mean, this is wrong in like so many ways. Uh, one, one thing is that uh, uh, it's very naive to think that there's only one thing that affects uh, the temperature. You know, people see, see, tend, to see, tend to see things in black and white, whereas in you know, many cases uh, you have uh, different shades of gray. Um, but the other thing is that, again, they don't take into account the, uh, the heat capacity. It's like, um, it's akin to saying that, um, you know, the, uh, the peak uh, solar uh, flux during the day um, is, is received around uh, noon, depending on your location within the time zone. However, the hottest time of day is not known. It's uh, say 2 p.m. So you could say, uh, just a second, we get from from 12 to 2 p.m. We get less sun, but the temperature increases. So it means that the sun has it is not responsible to the warming over the day. 
And it's the same is true uh, for, you know, the heat during the time of year. In the Northern Hemisphere, you know, we get most of the sun, uh, over the, mo most of the sun uh, around, uh, you know, late uh, June, June 21st or 22nd. Uh, so from June until now, until uh, August, there is a, uh, we, 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 we get progressively less sunshine. However, I don't know if you noticed, it's hotter now than it was in June. And uh, so you could say, naively, just a second, we get less sun uh, over these two months, but uh, it's heating, so it means that the sun is not responsible for this, uh, for the warming. It, it might be something else. Maybe, maybe humans are causing the warming between June and, uh, and August. So based on what you've seen, do you have any uh, predictions at all about what will happen to the global average temperature between now and 2050 or 2100? Or do we have to just wait and see? So, okay, so first of all, it, we cannot predict what the sun is going uh, to do because it has this kind of uh, chaotic behavior. There's some people that claim that uh, they can predict what the sun is going to do, but um, I'm, uh, I'm all, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's naive to, 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 to do this kind of predictions. Uh, I remember some talk, uh, I don't know what, around the solar cycle ago, uh, that someone sh sh showed a, a list of predictions of, of what the next solar cycle is going to be. Um, and it's like, you know, asking a million people what the winning lottery numbers are going to be. And, you know, one actually succeeds and say, ah, you have the right, uh, you have the right uh, method of, uh, you know, algorithm, how to predict what the lottery is going to do. Um, so I don't think, um, and the physical reasons to believe why it's, uh, why the system is uh, chaotic and, and the, it's uh, very hard to predict what's going to be, like say, within a solar cycle. So we cannot predict, I don't think we can predict what the sun is going to do, and therefore it means that there is a range of say one degree, which we cannot uh, predict what uh, the temperature variations are going to be, but what we can say is that over the past say 50 years, the sun has been uh, the most active it has uh, ever been, like it has been like that in the Middle Ages, or say maybe 5,000 years ago, and so on. Um, and therefore, if anything, uh, we can expect the solar contribution to decrease and therefore a, cause some kind of a cooling of order, I don't know what, maybe half a degree or something like that. Now, it's like, a, um, it's like a, you know, in the stock market, stocks can go as, as, uh, up as much as they want or down as much as they want, a, not as much as the stockholders. <laughs> Uh, but the sun, on the other hand, there's just a range of uh, of activity. So we know that there's like a, an upper limit and a lower limit. So we know uh, when to buy and when, sorry, when to sell and when to buy. Um, um, so in this sense, we don't know. Uh, we do know that uh, uh, um, CO2 does have an effect on, um, on the radiative forcing and therefore on climate. And my best estimate is that Doubling the amount of CO2 should uh, give a, should uh, give rise to a warming, which is say around one to one and a half degree increase. Uh, okay, so uh, 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 for comparison, the IPCC canonical range is so uh, it has been for many years for many reports it has been one and a half to four and a half degrees. Uh, this goes back to the Chani Federal Committee that uh, convened in the in 1979. Okay, it's actually. It's ridiculous that uh, you know um, forty years of, uh, of of research in climate, billions of dollars and you know euros or whatever spent in climate research, and we don't know the answer to the most uh, interesting question in climate science: what is Earth's climate sensitivity? Any better than we did uh, forty years ago? So in the last IPCC report, uh, they said, ah, it should be between two and four and a half. They haven't changed it that much, but um, um, but the, the but the truth is that if you look at empirical evidence and you take into account the effects that the sun has, then you can consistently show on different timescales that the climate sensitivity is between a one and one and a half degree increase per CO two doubling. Okay, so this you can see empirically, but you have to take into account the, the effect that the sun has. What do I mean? You see that uh, there was a warming of, say, one degree uh, Celsius over the uh, 20th century. And 
uh, you know that uh, you know uh, humans have contributed to a change in the energy budget because of uh, of CO two um, and a large uncertainty because of uh, effects of aerosol and whatever. But we won't get into that at least now. Um, so the thing is that you see that there was a change in temperature and you see that there was a change in the radiative forcing. Now, if you say that the warming is predominantly because of this change in radiative forcing associated with the human activity, then you reach the conclusion that yes, the climate sensitivity has to be large. However, if you do, if you do take into account the effect that the sun has, namely that its increased activity contributed to some of the warming, around half, then uh, you automatically reach the conclusion that in order to explain the same warming of around one degree, you need the climate sensitivity to be much smaller because the driving was much higher. So what I'm saying is that uh, you know people in the mainstream climate uh, community uh, do their best to ignore the 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 effect that the sun have on climate because they realize that um, it would have to I mean because of that they would have to change their uh, you know, the standard polemic that uh, most of the warming is anthropogenic and the climate sensitivity can be very large and, you know, whatever. So uh, what I think is that, um, uh, you know, the typical warming we can expect because of human activities uh, about this, you know, 0.1 degree increase per decade. Uh, but something, something else will happen by the year 2050, and that is that uh, I think we're going to uh, switch to other, you know, uh, to, uh, to a clean energy source, which is cost effective, and that's called uh, nuclear power. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I don't see us doubling the amount of CO2 because humanity is anyway going to switch uh, to nuclear. Uh, that's, I think, the only thing which is really viable if you, if you look at, uh, you know, solar or uh, or a wind or whatever, this is not uh, not really viable. And um, um, and what that means is that, uh, okay, so the way I see it, uh, I don't know if you want to uh, go into the politics, or energy politics uh, yeah. <laughs> at this point, but what I think will happen is that, uh, you know, countries like uh, China, which uh, don't have, uh, well, public opinion is uh, doesn't play a major role, um, they are going to uh, switch to um, uh, to you know nuclear power, and eventually the West will see just a second uh, if it's good enough for them, uh, it should be good enough for us. So I think this is what will happen, and um, uh, I, I I I don't see you know the temperature increasing by more than say half a degree uh, until uh, you know in fifty years. All right. Just to make sure I understand you, if you go back to like a thousand year time scale and try to explain the Minoan and the Roman and the medieval warm periods, you think cosmic rays pretty much explain those for the most part? Yeah. Solar activity variations, which uh, modulate the cosmic ray flux, uh, affect uh, the climate. And these give rise to changes which are typically, say, maybe one degree. Uh, if, you, if they operate on a time scale of a century, then you get a one degree response. On a shorter time scale, you get a smaller response because of the heat capacity of the ocean. So even though the 11-year solar cycle uh, is as large as the long-term variations in solar activity over the 11-year solar cycles because of the heat capacity of the oceans, uh, it's very hard to get a large temperature response. So the temperature variations that you see over the 11 years are typically around 0.1 degree um, whereas on longer time scales, you would get a one a one degree response. So on a time scale of maybe a thousand years, are the cosmic rays coming into our solar system fairly constant? And then the changes we're seeing here are yes. just changes on yes. our sun. Yes. But on longer time yes. scales, we're moving through the spiral arms, and then we see other changes in the amount of cosmic rays. Yeah. So on on a on on a time scale of a, of several million years, you would start seeing variations because of our changing galactic environment. Uh, there is a very clear uh, 32 million year oscillation in the in the climate data, uh, which uh, you can easily associate with the vertical motion of the solar system perpendicular to the galactic plane. Um, 
how do we know that it's um, that it's this? Uh, well, first of all, you see this very clear. Um, you see like 15 oscillations over the past uh, half billion years in the temperature data. And um, it's like really clear and it's like statistically significant at the like 11 sigma. It's like um, you don't see things like that in science. And well, actually you do. This is an example. Um, so uh, you see this very large variation uh, or very statistically significant variation. Um, it has the right phase because uh, we know that we are very close to the galactic plane. The density of cosmic rays has to be larger, and therefore uh, it should be the peak coldness. And in, in this 32 million year oscillation, the peak coldness is uh, roughly, roughly now. Um, and then the other thing is that the 32 million year oscillation is actually not constant. There is um, a period modulation. Like sometimes the 32 million years is shorter, and sometimes it's longer. And it turns out that this period modulation is exactly what you would expect from a, the fact that we don't orbit the galaxy in a circle. Now, a, you, you know that in Keplerian a, potentials, if you have like a star or some, and, and a planet orbiting the star, then the orbits are going to be ellipses. You know, this is the, you know, one of Kepler's laws. And a, the first, First law, um, and uh, but in the galactic potential, uh, because the mass is smeared, the revolution period, which is around uh, 250 million years, is different than the period it takes the solar system to oscillate in and out. So you don't get closed ellipses. Now, uh, we know from astronomical data very well what this uh, radial uh, period is supposed to be. It's uh, between 170 and 180 million years. And we also know what is our what is our phase in this oscillation. Now, what happened is that when we are closer to the galactic center, the density at the galactic plane is higher, so we're oscillating faster. When we are further out, uh, the density of the galactic plane is lower, so we're oscillating slower in the direction perpendicular to the galactic plane. And you see that in the data. You can actually see very clearly this uh, 170 million year uh, oscillation uh, due to the radial epicyclic motion of the solar system. So uh, on, on long time scales of order, say, uh, tens of millions of years to a billion years, uh, you really see the, our galactic motion imprinted in the cosmic ray flux and imprinted in the climate. Um, you can uh, you see our passages through the spiral arms every 145 million years. You see the uh, perpendicular motion and you see the radial uh, oscillation. So, um, and this explains a, I don't know more than half of the variance over this time scale. Of course, there are other things which affect the climate, like uh, you know, atmospheric composition or uh, or whatever. So uh, I had Carl Otto Weiss on this podcast, and he talked about the three lengths of cycles on Earth: uh, the thousand year, the four sixty three, and the one ninety. Does your work uh, uh, explain any of that? Any of those uh, cycles of those lengths, or no? I don't know where I don't know where it comes from. I mean, there is a on a, there is an intermediate time scale of uh, tens of thousands of years, um, and the standard explanation. I mean, you see the um, you know the the ice ages uh, appear on Earth. Um, you have a I don't know twenty thousand years ago, uh, Canada was covered. Uh, you know, was underneath a mile of uh, ice, and. Uh, so these variations on this time scale of you know tens of thousands of years, the fact that you know every hundred thousand years we have now an ice an, an ice age, uh, the general uh, wisdom is that it comes from a uh, Milankovit cycles. Milankovit cycles are uh, changes in the orbital parameter of the Earth. The fact that the ellipse or the the ellipse of the orbit is changing its uh, centricity. Uh, the fact that uh, the ellipse itself is processing, and Earth itself is processing, and uh, you know, like the top, and also we're doing this uh, notation, just like the top does. Uh, on a time scale of say 20, 40, and 100,000 years now, um, 
it's not like a, a watertight theory. There are things which, uh, which people still don't understand. For example, why is it that uh, uh, over the past few hundred, a few hundred thousand years, the 100 a thousand year cycle has been dominant, but before that, it has been the uh, hundred thousand years is the change in eccentricity. Uh, but before that, it was the forty thousand year uh, change due to uh, the notation. Uh, and uh, I mean, it's hard to get such large effects. Um, there are models, uh, but again, it's not. Uh, it's not an airtight uh, theory, but uh, it's the best uh, we have to explain what's going on on over these time scales. So, in your work, have you found any relationship between uh, solar activity and uh, volcanic activity on Earth, or uh, geological uh, releases of heat, earthquakes, anything like that? No. Okay. Um, I mean, frankly, I don't see why there should be a link. Um, or uh, any difference at all between uh, in the just the straight up distance of the Earth to the Sun? Does does that change enough to cause any change? Well, the, uh, the actual distance from the Earth to the Sun. Uh, are you finding that to change? So the the, the average change? flux that we get from the Sun, uh, uh, almost uh, has almost no changes whatsoever. I mean, there is a it's, you know fourth order uh, there are some changes, but they are very like fourth order. The eccentricity, I think, uh, and it's 100% true, but though really minute changes and they cannot explain uh, any climate variations. Um, so, no, I don't think uh, Earth uh, uh, changes uh, or has changed its uh, distance from the sun, and uh, I don't think it has been responsible for any climate variations. Are you working pretty closely with Henrik Svensmark? Yeah. He actually spent uh, three months here with me. Very good. And you guys did some filming for an upcoming movie, right? Uh, yes. And if you want to talk about that, or you don't need to if you don't want to. Um, <laughs> wait and see. <laughs> we'll wait and see. I'll, I probably shouldn't ask you this, but it seems like there's a Nobel Prize out here somewhere, isn't it, for this work on cosmic rays, if this does prove out to be such a major uh, factor in Earth's climate? There has to be a Nobel Prize awarded for this, doesn't there? I shouldn't say have to, but eventually, yeah, yeah, yeah. years from now, it's pretty important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> something, something to think about. Uh, what do you think, uh, as you look out here, I think are you, you must be following the climate debate and a little bit looking at what other people are saying, what other skeptics are saying. What do you think uh, is the biggest error that other people are making, uh, other skeptics, when they're uh, arguing uh, you know, but uh, against the human influence, do you see people making straight up errors that we should not be making? Okay, there are, I mean, there are people who say, oh, CO2 doesn't have any effect on the uh, the energy budget whatsoever. And this is wrong. You can uh, you can see the greenhouse effect uh, operating with satellite uh, data. Uh, you can measure, you know, the incoming flux, the outgoing flux in, you know, the relevant wave band. Uh, I'm not saying, you know, it's uh, 3.8 watts per square meter as um, as uh, the IPCC is quoting. Uh, there are reasons to believe. I mean, if you ask, for example, Will Happer, it will uh, give you a, a good explanation why it should be somewhat less. Uh, empirically, uh, because I, um, in some recent work I've done on trying to, uh, or we've done with, uh, I've done with colleagues, it, it, where we looked again at the uh, climate over the past half billion years, we uh, can actually uh, independently um, measure the radiative forcing of the CO2. And the reason is that CO2 has had large variations over the past uh, half billion years. Um, uh, I mean, there were changes uh, by a factor of a, like an order of magnitude, if you go back, a, say, I don't know, maybe a good example is 450 million years ago, in the Silurian period, there was a, it was colder on Earth than it is now, but we had maybe 10 times as much CO2. So if you look at these large variations in the CO2, um, and you model the climate, a, because there are other changes 
okay, because there's no correlation between the CO2 and the temperature, um, it means that the solar, the fact that the solar um, a flux has been increasing, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it, but over the past four billion years, uh, the solar flux has increased by about 25%. Um, and this is because as the sun is burning uh, hydrogen into helium and the molecular weight of the center is changing, it slowly burns uh, things at a, at a progressively higher rate. Um, and uh, in order not to see the variations that the CO2 has on, uh, on the temperature, uh, it needs to relatively cancel, be canceled out by this, uh, by this warming effect that the sun has had. Um, and with that, you can actually uh, place an independent estimate for what the radiative, uh, uh, what is the change in the energy budget associated with the CO2. And you find that it's uh, somewhat smaller. It should be around three or uh, or, or maybe a little bit less what, uh, watts per square meter per CO2W. Um, okay, so one error is people saying, ah, no, CO2 cannot, it doesn't heat whatsoever. It even cools or, you know, what, you can find a lot of uh, different claims. Another mistake that people do uh, both on, say, the skeptic and the um, and the mainstream is uh, not, to, not to take into account the heat capacity. They're trying to build, you know, extremely simplistic models, just correlating temperature with the uh, different drivers. Um, and... Uh, uh, so people, uh, people on both sides of the debate uh, do this mistake. Um, what else? Um, I don't know. But nothing really pops out, but there are a lot of mistakes uh, on you know, both sides of the debate. Uh, is there anyone else working in the, with the cosmic rays like you and Henrik Svensmark are that we should know about? Those are the only two names that I know about, the people that are heavily looking at this. Uh, no, because I mean, I mean, the thing is that um, it's a, uh, it's extremely hard. To, um, it's extremely hard to get funding. Um, it's extremely hard to publish. It's extremely hard, like it's a very hard discipline to work at in because uh, you know we're ostracized by the community. Um, you know, people with uh, lep leprosy in biblical times were treated nicer. Uh, so. Um, uh, so, I mean, people don't like uh, working in this field. Um, so it makes life uh, much harder. On the other hand, it's uh, it's nice because, you know, the, all these discoveries, um, which which we have been uh, making over the past 20 years, you know, everyone has been leaving, uh, leaving those discoveries for uh, for Henrik and I, or I know it's, uh, Jan Weiser, who is a geologist, has been working with us as well. Uh, but that's basically it. Like, you know, all these uh, amazing discoveries are left there for us to uh, to discover because nobody else wants to, uh, to uh, you know, get their hands dirty. How good are our measurements right now, like this year of uh, cosmic ray activity? Are you getting any sort of any sort of real time data or? On, on what's happening in the cosmic rays. I, I mean, I don't, I really don't, uh, I don't look at this kind of stuff because, uh, you know, these, you know, short variations are not, uh, I mean, basically, okay, so uh, on the, the, uh, the 11 year solar cycle is basically the shortest time scales over which you can see temperature variations associated with the change in solar activity. Um, but on really short time scales, you have, uh, what's called uh, Phobos decreases. Um, when you have um, something like a coronal mass ejection, you have like a magnetic loop closing over the sun, and then uh, you get this um, release of a lot of energy uh, on a relatively short time scale. You get um, a gust in the solar wind, and as a, as a response, you get a reduction, a several day long reduction in the cosmic ray flux reaching the Earth. So you can use that um, as an experiment to see how these changes in the cosmic wave flux uh, translate into changes in the atmospheric aerosols, uh, because uh, we know that the link is through the fact that 
Atmospheric ionization, which is governed by cosmic rays, uh, affects the formation of a, a new cloud condensation nuclei. You know, when you reach 100% humidity, you need surfaces upon which you can um, a, a condense the water vapor. And um, if you have more of these surfaces or, or less of these surfaces, you're going to change the uh, characteristics of the um, of the aerosols. Uh, sorry, of the clouds. Uh, if you have, for example, more a uh, cloud condensation nuclei, what will happen is that when you do form the clouds, uh, the clouds are going to have more surface reflecting the sunlight, so they're going to be whiter, and they're going to live longer. Um, so overall, they're going to cool uh, the air. Um, so over these um, uh, four bush decreases, uh, which are these, de these several day long decrease in the cosmic ray flux associated with the, these uh, gusts in the, so in, the, um, in the solar wind, uh, you can see the response in uh, aerosols. You can see the immediate response that uh, you, you form uh, less aerosols. And then like several days later, because it takes several days for these cloud condensation nuclei to grow and become large enough for them to serve as the cloud condensation nuclei. Uh, so several days later, you see a reduction in different uh, cloud uh, uh, characteristics. Um, and you can also see the geographic distribution, and you can see, you know, how things uh, how things operate. So you can use this uh, short time slot to actually understand uh, these variations of the cosmic ray flux. Now, I don't care, you know, if I go out today, so there's going to be more cosmic rays or less cosmic rays, because frankly, you know, it might change just a little bit the cloud cover. Uh, I do care about, like, you know, uh, how many such, you know, four decreases were there recently, because th these are, you know, the kind of experiments that we can use in order to see the effects uh, taking place on the, uh, on short time scales. Yeah, I mean, to me, it sounds like confirmation that you're on the right track. If there's these several days event, then you consistently can uh, connect events on the sun to cloudiness on earth. I mean, yeah. you can, uh, see variations in the cosmic or cosmic flux over the geological time scales and the corresponding climate variation. You can see on shorter time scales, uh, you know, this 32 million year oscillations. You can see on uh, millennial time scales variations in uh, solar activity, uh, which you can reconstruct again with say uh, carbon 14. Um, and so that these variations in solar activity, which are you know highly non-trivial, and you can see climate variations together with them. You can see on a, a, on shorter decadal timescales, say over the 20th century or say several uh, centuries, you can see again, uh, variations between solar activity and uh, climate on Earth. You can see, um, you know, the the milder minimum, like uh, the, um, the latter half of the 17th century, uh, the sun was particularly inactive and on Earth it was particularly cold. Or the Middle Ages, the sun was as active as today, and it was uh, as warm. Um, on shorter time scales, on the eleven-year solar, uh, on the eleven -year of the eleven-year solar cycle, you can see climate variations or typical temperature variations of say 0.1 degree, uh, which doesn't sound much, but it's actually huge. Um, you can see changes in the sea level, uh, the rate of change of the sea level. Uh, you can see like um, you know at, uh, ten uh, variations over the past uh, century. Um, to, uh, concur concurrently uh, with solar activity, um, you can uh, see, uh, so, and you have maybe half a dozen different time scales, uh, sorry, different data sets showing you the 11 year solar cycle. And one of them is the variations in the cloud cover, um, which is somewhat problematic because of a, a, a cross calibration problems that uh, you have with several instruments. Um, on um, even shorter time scales, these Phobos decreases, you can see um, ah, on the 11 year solar cycle, there's another thing which is interesting. The only uh, thing that changes with solar activity, which uh, actually sees that the real cycle is not 11 years, but 22 years. I mean, what happened is that every 11 years, the North and South Pole of the Sun switch polarity. Um, 
but if you look at say the amount of uh, UV that you get from the sun or the uh, or um, a I don't know what uh, the amount of radio, the number of sunspots, whatever, they are uh, insensitive to the polarity of the um, solar magnetic field. The only thing that does uh, that is sensitive to the polarity is the cosmic ray flux. And the reason is that the cosmic ray flux is primarily, or the cosmic rays are primarily composed of positive particles. Um, so because the sun breaks the symmetry because it's rotating, and because the cosmic rays are positive, it turns out that odd and even cycles of the sun don't look the same. And um, the flux of cosmic rays uh, during solar minimum is um, is relatively smooth in a in, in one polarity and it's very sharp in another polarity and if you look at the cloud cover you see the same behavior in the cloud cover as well so it's another indication that uh, indeed cosmic rays do it then on the shorter time scales over a uh, cycle of uh, time scales of say days you have this uh, gust in the solar wind which caused a several day long reduction in the cosmic ray flux called four bush decreases and you can see the changes in the aerosols and in the cloud cover due to this variation. So this is like a, 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 a you know a smoking gun showing you that it's a, 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 it's a, it's cosmic rays. And then uh, we can uh, we found three uh, microphysical effects which relate charge to the nucleation of new aerosols, and then. Uh, the the growth to become I mean they are formed at, at a typical size of say two or three nanometers and they have to grow to become say fifty nanometers. So we found two a uh, one effect that increases the nucleation of this aerosol, of of the aerosols and in, and two more effects which increase the survival of these aerosols as they grow to become uh, this this uh, cloud condensation nuclei. So we found them theoretically and we can go to the lab. Um, set up experiments and then see these mechanisms operating in the lab. So it's like um, we have everything. We have the empirical evidence. We have the mechanisms. We understand them theoretically. We can see them operating in the lab. It's like everything is there, but people just don't want to accept it because if the sun has a large effect on climate, it means that uh, you have to change your views of global warming and realize that it's not black and white. It's like you know, the sun has contributed a non-negligible part of the warming. The climate sensitivity is not uh, is not very large, um, and so forth. So, you know, people have a hard time accepting it. So, uh, as you're talking there, it re reminded me of a Gerald Pollack was on my podcast a while back. I don't know if you're familiar with his work, but he says um, electrical charge is very important to all weather phenomena, including the formation of clouds. So I'm just curious if any of his work is uh, might make it sway into your work or. Uh, okay, so there are, there were actually other uh, suggestions on how atmospheric charge uh, and cosmic rays uh, can affect the climate. Um, uh, there was a suggestion by uh, Brian Tinsley, um, and. Uh, and that had to do with, with the fact that uh, the conductivity of the atmosphere uh, is governed by the child, which is governed by cosmic rays. Um, and then you have the thunderstorms uh, charge the atmosphere. And uh, and then um, so so the 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 electric field that you have depends on the cosmic ray flux. And uh, this, in principle, can affect the formation of, say, ice particles uh, in clouds and, and things like that. Um, so it's a suggestion. Uh, whether it works and plays a role, I, I don't know, uh, because I didn't study it. Um, yeah, if I understood him right, uh, Gerald said that there can be times when, because of electrical charge, that rain can fall faster than terminal velocity because of... It's being uh, like sucked towards the ground. I may have that incorrect, but anyway, it's, it's something that I need to go back and look at again. Uh, uh, That's an aside. I wonder whether.
I don't know. Truth is, I never estimated, you know, how large a, a, such an effect, an effect should be. A, maybe it is something which probably can be estimated. Okay. Uh, what else should I have asked that I forgot to ask? Or do you have any favorite diagrams or anything you want to put up at this point to make sure that people see them? Uh, I think probably the most important uh, graph is uh, is this one. Uh, what you see here is uh, about 80 years of data. Uh, the red uh, dashed lines are uh, it's basically the solar activity. So you see the eleven-year solar cycle, and uh, the blue is the rate of change of the sea level um, as obtained with the uh, tide gauges uh, located in a, in geologically inactive uh, regions. Okay, so someone uh, picked out uh, uh, geologically inactive uh, uh, tide gauges. I took uh, the data and uh, you know added it, uh, differentiated in order to get the the rate. And as you can see, uh, the rate of change of the sea follows the solar activity. Okay, uh, this is like a statistically significant at a very high level. Now, what it means is that every time the sun is active, the oceans are expanding, and on short time scales. Most of the sea level changes because of uh, thermal expansion. It's not because of uh, the melting of uh, ice caps or whatever. So, on uh, because of these short, uh, because of these variations, um, you can actually quantify the change in energy budget associated with solar activity. You know, when the sun is active, you can see that the heat, heat oceans are heating up by a given rate, or they're cooling by another rate when the when the sun is inactive. So we can use the oceans as um, as what's called a calorimeter to measure the solar forcing, and you find that it is a, it is about say one watt per square meter variations over the solar cycle. Uh, while you know, if you open the IPCC reports, they tell you it's around 0.1 or even less watts per square meter. So it shows you, it proves beyond you know any doubt that the Sun has a huge effect on climate, but it's completely ignored. And I don't know if you can see, but this thing was published in 2008. So it should have uh, been picked out by, I don't know, the two last IPCC reports, but obviously they just ignored it. Uh, have you had any, so, uh, I'm sorry, have you had any contact with the IPCC as a, have you been part of it in any way throughout your career? Uh, no, none whatsoever. Uh, you know, they're not really interested. Incidentally, these uh, variations, you can then use uh, you can use the uh, satellite data over the past 20 years, and you can see that this thing uh, continues. Uh, uh, with the satellite data, you can see that it continues. Uh, and I, I think maybe this is probably the most important message uh, I want to convey, and that is that the sun has a large effect and it's being completely ignored. And um, because it's ignored the IPCC and the like, they reach uh, the wrong conclusions because the, you know some of the conclusions rest on the assumption that there's nothing else which has a large effect on climate. But as I said, it's ignored. Now, uh, when you hear criticisms uh, against solar activity affecting the climate, a, one criticism is that uh, we don't know of a mechanism that uh, can give you such a large effect, so none can have. It's maybe a fluke. But you have like half a dozen different data sets which show you this huge signal, so you cannot ignore it. And the conclusion should have been, look, the the... A, 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 even if we don't know what the mechanism is, we see that there is a large effect. So there should be a mechanism. We should, you know, try to seek out what it is. Uh, but in the meantime, we have to take the sun into account. Now, a, but the truth is that you know, now twenty years later, I mean, if you would have asked me twenty years ago, I would have told you I don't know exactly what the mechanism is. I think it's related to cosmic rays. But nowadays, we know exactly what the mechanism is because you know we can. 
we calculate the different effects, we can go to the lab and see them operating and so forth. So today we even know what the mechanism is, but this is, you know, a academically interesting you know, to know what the effect is, but in reality, you don't even have to know what the effect is or even admit that the cosmic rays are the things which are doing it because you see that the sun has a large effect and it has to be taken into account. It's like, you know, um, you know, Mendel with, uh, with uh, genetics, uh, you know, he came up with his genetics in, you know, the 19th century, uh, you know, playing with the, with the peas. Uh, but uh, so, you know, the, the people understood that there's this thing called uh, genetics, which you have to uh, consider. Um, and, but the mechanism itself was there only, you know, with Watson and Crick in the 1950s. Um, so, uh, you know, so also this argument that we don't understand the mechanism, I mean, it's twice wrong. It's, it's irrelevant and it's wrong. Can you talk a little bit more about the difficulties in getting funding? There's no government anywhere that wants to fund this type of research, no company, no individual. So um, in general, I mean, it's it's usually hard to get, okay, so um, okay, uh, it's extremely hard because um, uh, okay, I, I, if I apply for research grant, like uh, standard grants, um, uh, say here in Israel, then um, if it's somewhat related to because the grant proposals are being refereed by external uh, reviewers, which are usually I mean they're from outside Israel, from Europe, or from the U.S. or whatever, um, then the reviews are always uh, extremely negative. So it's extremely hard to get funding in any standard uh, standard way. Uh, so. Uh, my colleague uh, Henrik Svensmark, you know, got some funding uh, from a from a Kaltberg Foundation many years ago, and then uh, from directly from the government. In general, it's extremely hard for him to get funding. Uh, I got some funding uh, directly from the Ministry of Energy here in Israel, uh, but that's because it's, uh, it's it was a non-standard uh, way of getting funds and. Fortunately, in Israel, um, people are more open-minded. Um, it's not like I'm not a. I mean, there are more people in Israel that like me than people that uh, really dislike me, um, and it has nothing to do with uh, politics. I think it has to do with the the idea that uh, um, you know, I mean. In Israel, uh, you know, we like to argue, we like to have good discussions, and uh, um, in this sense, you know, in the university, I, I don't feel I'm a persona non grata uh, whatsoever. I was, you know, the head of my department. Uh, they asked people asked me to be the uh, the dean of sciences, um, so I, I I don't have a problem in the in, in you know the close scale. Uh, I did get some funding uh, directly. Uh, and that's because, again, of the the situation in Israel is uh, different than what it is in Europe and the U.S. in this sense. Uh, but standard funding, it's extremely hard. And uh, for my colleagues, uh, for Henrik Svensmark, you know, for uh, Jan Weiser at the time, it was extremely hard to get funding uh, for this kind of research because uh, um, because you know the all the the, the communities you know doing their best to uh, make sure that we don't get any funds. How much money would it talk, take to make a difference? How much funding would you need to uh, do what you want to do um, reasonably for, over the next few years? A, okay, so I think the the most important funding would be a, a, to run the experiments in uh, Denmark, that, uh, to run the lab that uh, Henrik built. Uh, currently, because uh, we don't have funding, it's... Uh, the experiments on the, you know, on a halt. Um, so that would require, you know, funding in the, you know, hundreds of thousands for several years. Um, for uh, for the stuff I need, I want to do, which is, you know, run the, you know, various simulations of aerosols or whatever, to, you know, to to, to see how this how these uh, uh, mechanisms operate on a global scale. Um, 
that's uh, I don't know, let's say a, a postdoc salary or something like that. So that would be a, a how much is it? A you know maybe fifty thousand dollars a year or or something like that. Okay, very good. I mean, it's it's not a lot of money for you know standard uh, funding agencies, uh, but you know very relaxing for some re strange reason. Okay. Um, any other points you'd like to make? We're coming up on an hour here. This has been totally fascinating for me. Anything else you'd like to uh, to leave us with here? I can talk about anything you want. It's like uh, you know the weather, maybe. Um... <laughs> Uh, let's see. I think I'm good for now. I, I, I think uh, let's go ahead and wrap up. I, I, I know you're, uh, you don't have much time, but uh, I'd love to have you back on again sometime. This has been fantastic. Very, very, uh, I'm learning a lot from you. So thank you. Okay. My pleasure. All right. We'll talk to you uh, next time on Near Shavi. Thank you.